We're here in Orlando, Florida, and I'm here with Tony Presley. Thanks for swinging down today, Tony. Hey, Adam. What's happening? <laughs> Not much. Yeah, it's been a minute since we've seen each other. I know, it's been ages, it seems like. Definitely some years. A few years. Mm -hmm. uh, can you give a background to who you are, how you got here, and how we know each other? Sure. So, um, Tony Presley, I play professional soccer for the Orlando Pride. Um, I know you, Adam. You came in um, years ago and helped us with our strength and conditioning. Um, you're the best at what you do, and you were gracious enough to help me in an off season with my programming um, that I still have, by the way, <laughs> and look at from time to time um, to keep me right but yeah that's a little bit about me and, and how I know you wonderful and you recently had started a side business outside of outside of soccer mm -hmm. so I think like soccer is one part of your identity mm -hmm. yeah we know that about you but at the same time like you launched this girls gone veg yeah right so you can talk about that too yeah so um I love cooking and one of my teammates who previously played at Orlando she loved cooking as well we came together and became girls gone veg um so we had a little a little YouTube series that we have done um, and now we're in the process of doing an actual cookbook um, that will be released sometime next year, probably the end of next year. Um, so yeah, just constantly working on that and, and we've taken a lot of photos for it recently, got our manuscript done. Um, it's taken a lot of my time, but it's something that I, I really enjoy, so. I, I bet, I mean, you, like your social is awesome with all the food that you're cooking. And by the way, it's like it is like classic food porn. It's wonderful. Uh, and you really, like you really make like for me like not being not living the vegan lifestyle, not really venturing into that. Like when I see what you put out on social, and the food looks phenom phenomenal. <laughs> well, I'm glad you think so. <laughs> it's like what what led you to like you two really enjoy cooking, mm -hmm. right? But like what led to this path of like you know what let's let's do something with it. Was there a reason why? Um, I think we just knew like we enjoyed spending time together and this was one of the ways that we connected and bonded um, our mutual love over food and like being able to share that with other people um, and I think just one of the things that I really enjoy about vegan cooking is like getting to like I don't know if I should like trick people quote unquote um, and like give them kind of something familiar um, to taste and they're like oh wow like that doesn't really taste like too much different than like what I'm used to eating so um, I really enjoy that aspect of it. What's your favorite trick to play on people? Uh, any kind of pasta. I'm really good. I know you're Italian, so yeah. I'm really good, I think, at making like Italian Italian things. If you had to pick one dish to win someone over, what are you cooking? Probably lasagna or like a baked ziti. And like how do you make it? So we use, sometimes I'll use like mushrooms and onions, but I like to use like Beyond Meat or Impossible Meat sometimes. Um, and then like make the own ricotta with like cashews. I boil them, blend them up, get the consistency right, get the flavor right. Um, and it just, it tastes the same. It looks the same, I think. And I'll have to make it for you sometime. What do you like the, like I hear the Beyond Meat, the Impossible Meat. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of players I work with as well still like love to venture out and try the vegan mm -hmm. lifestyle or they're full blown vegan. Yeah. So like how do you, I guess I feel like there's always this debate of like, oh, that's fake meat, this is real meat. Like mm -hmm. when someone presents that question to you, how do yeah. you answer it? I think for me in general, I try to limit the amount of like processed food I eat anyway. So I'm not always relying on um, like the beyonds or the impossibles. But I think, um, I don't know, for me, it's just like, well, I'd rather eat this than a little cow, so. <laughs> That's the trade off. <laughs> hey, listen, hey, you, you have you have your reasons why and that makes sense. And yeah. and I think that the the struggle that some people have is mm -hmm. they just want to pick a stance and stay hard to it. Mm -hmm. I think you come at it from a way of like, hey, like let's just try something different. Let me try and be a bit more creative. Like I see a lot of creativity in your mm -hmm. cooking, which I would, is that fair to say? Yeah, I think that's what makes it so fun too, trying to figure out how I can replicate like these other ingredients. Right. And to me that like that I always feel like there's no way this is like vegan, right? Mm -hmm. I feel like there's like stuff that's buffalo, that the buffalo flavor, yeah. I don't know, like buffalo cauliflower tenders, mm -hmm. or like that stuff really, I mean, I've had some great fried buffalo cauliflower, yeah. it's wonderful. Like mm -hmm. is that in your wheelhouse too? Yeah, that's they fun. make some really good, I think a lot of products too, you they're already vegan that we don't even think about. So like a lot of buffalo sauce is just, it's vegan anyways. Okay. Um, but yeah, like the cauliflower is a great vehicle for that. And then, being being a pro soccer player, 
right? The demands for what you have to do. Mm -hmm. I think the fitness components of what a soccer player has to go through are underrated. Mm -hmm. I think they just have to run around and kick a ball. There's so much more to it. Mm -hmm. So living the vegan lifestyle, right? There's always this, I don't want to say always, but I, one common misconception I hear. If you're going to ask me where I get my protein, I'm going to throw this microphone. <laughs> No, 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 okay. not, not about the protein, not at all. No, it's like, how do you make it work, right? Like, how do you, how do you make it work? Especially, soccer's a little bit more gracious with the schedule compared mm -hmm. to the NBA schedule. NBA schedule is very trying, and I think that inhibits people's ability to live a full vegan lifestyle mm -hmm. without intention. Uh, so within your sport, with what you have to do, how do you make it work? Um, I think the fact that I love to cook so much helps. I think the support around me with like um, team admins, you know, if we need meals on the road or whatever, they're making sure that we're ordering from a place that has at least a few vegan options. So that's always really nice. And I think we live in like the day and age where like a lot of places are now offering vegan options um, because they see the demand for it. So it's a lot better than it was when I first started. Um, I still, you know, I like to be prepared if I'm traveling and I know that, you know, probably some airports where I'm traveling long flights to, from here to Portland or Seattle, I'll bring food with me um, so that I'm not starving and I don't have to resort to eating crap, you know, what, with whatever I pick up in the airport. So I think just being prepared um, and I don't know, just, I think that's the biggest thing, just being prepared for things. Yeah, and that, that's, where I, that's where I see other players have success with it, is mm -hmm. it's like, oh, I'm gonna adopt a vegan lifestyle, but then they don't think about what that takes. Because mm -hmm. you're right, like when you are traveling, you have to be a little bit more thoughtful mm -hmm. about what you're doing. And you and let's, let's kind of shed some light into the conditions of travel for NWSL, like right in the NBA, everything's chartered, mm -hmm. private, buses, like fly out whenever you want. NWSL, uh, with the Orlando Pride, what does that look like for y'all? Yep, so we just get on a plane at MCO and uh, we fly in com um, commercial and we get on a plane and go wherever we have to go. We don't have the luxury of flying charter planes at the moment. Hopefully one day we will, but yeah, I think that's one thing that um, I'm very mindful about as well. Like I know when we go to Seattle, like their airports are more be vegan friendly than when we go to say like Kansas City or something. So I'm always keeping that in the back of my mind when we're traveling and, and being prepared. Got it. So for stuff. those that aren't necessarily athletes, mm -hmm. but they want to live the vegan lifestyle and they're traveling as much as they, as they do with their job, mm -hmm. what advice, besides being prepared, what advice do you have for them? Um, I think just being like, kind to yourself and knowing that like it's okay to mess up um, and like not everyone has to go in like um, cold turkey like you can change little like a meatless Monday or something like that like here and there to get yourself into it to get acclimated um, and then just like not being so hard on yourself and if you can't find something like it's okay like try again next time or Maybe that will remind you to bring something with you next time. Um, but I think I see a lot of people like kind of get down on themselves when they kind of mess up and it's like, it's okay. Like you're giving it a, your best effort. So I think that's, I think that's great, a great piece to it because like if you try going all in and then you have that one failure, you just like want to stop. Yeah. And it like kind of like it's depressing, it's defeating, <laughs> right? It's like, yeah. it's like anything new. I think, I think that's probably what it comes down to. It's, just, it's something new and you're not going to do it right the first mm -hmm. time. Just like you said, one step, be gracious to yourself, be kind to yourself and just try it yeah. and see what you find. And mm -hmm. then definitely pick up your cookbook at the same time. Sure, yeah, some. absolutely pick up the cookbook. <laughs> that will help you. <laughs> so when we were working together, mm -hmm. I don't think you were... Were you full? Were you full vegan lifestyle at that point? No, I think that was when I was kind of transitioning into okay. becoming a vegan. Um, I was mainly eating and um, making vegetarian meals, and then I kind of was like, "Oh well, veganism doesn't sound too much different than what I'm already doing, so I'm just kind of gonna go for it and try it out." And I've stuck with it ever since. And was there a particular? moment in time that said you know this is this is right for me this this works and what comes to mind is like two phases of that mm -hmm. one like the personal lifestyle side of things yeah but then also from a performance perspective mm -hmm. or recovery perspective like i hear athletes talk about both is there 
you can shed light into any of those directions? Yeah, absolutely. So I think um, when I was transitioning and I was in the off season and uh, working out pretty uh, regularly, I think you had me on a workout schedule like six days a week. <laughs> we had some goals in mind. We yeah, had, we had we, some absolute goals in mind. We had some goals in mind. But I think the the diet that I then adopted by um, transitioning to veganism really like helped um, like pair with that. I think it helped accelerate and get me towards my goals closer than I thought I was going to be because it helped me lean out. Um, I noticed I was sleeping a bit better. Um, I wasn't as sore between between sessions. Um, I could recover faster. And then um, I think just like learning all of like the animal like welfare pieces to it, um, that kind of like struck a chord with me because it's like once you know things, you can't really unknow. So. Um, at first it was definitely just like, you know, I'm going to stick to this diet. But as I started to learn things, I was like, wow, I think this is like something I could really turn into like a whole lifestyle. It's funny you bring up the the soreness piece too, because I remember like distinctively there was a phase of your training Mm. where like you were texting like Adam, like I am, have been sore for like two weeks straight. And like I was trying to rack my head around it. And I'm glad you were able to find a solution on Mm. it because you're not the first person I hear who says, yeah, you're like, you know what? I just feel like I can recover faster. Like, I, there's a couple of players I know that have adopted the lifestyle and they swear by it and say, you know what, like going into a back to back, I feel better. Mm-hmm. I don't feel as bogged down. Would you say that would be kind of a similar sentiment that you share? Yeah, absolutely. I think even too now, like after our, our games, like, you know, like our games are, are tough. Like we're moving constantly for 90 plus minutes and um, it takes like what I think was like three days for your body to fully recover from a soccer game. and. Like a lot of the times at, directly after the soccer game, like I still feel like pretty okay. So I don't know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, it's a great, but it's a great point. I think it's working for you and you mm. are right. It does like the research suggests that by 48, 72 hours, your, your markers of recovery or inflammation, let's call it, are starting to come down, mm-hmm. which just on a side note begs the question why we're we playing so many basketball games. Whole topic, <laughs> of, whole nother conversation uh, because the science says we shouldn't be. Um, but anyways, anyways, so within the, the vegan lifestyle, okay, we talked about the personal choices, we mm-hmm. talked about uh, what you, how you feel from a performance recovery. Are there things that you had to change within your training or your things that you adopted to complement it or the things that you backed off because of you, how well you felt? No, I don't think I've changed anything in my training. I think um, the only thing I was really mindful about is like supplements and stuff. Okay. Um, so that, like since I wasn't like eating like red meat, like, you know, B12 and like iron and like all of these things. Um, but I think there was nothing that by being a vegan limited me physically. Gotcha. You feel like your energy levels were okay, high, yeah. good enough, eating Great. enough. Because mm-hmm. the other thing I hear is, oh, it's just so hard to get the calories. It's so yeah. hard to just eat the quantity. You, what do you say to that question or that point of contention? Yeah, I, I don't think it's difficult at all. Well, for me, I don't think so. Um, I think, you know, after a training, I'm always, you know, getting the same amount of protein in that I that I need to get in to fuel my muscles and recover and. Um, making sure that I'm eating well and I don't think a lack of calories is um, for me personally an issue. Um, I do notice that like I'm able to eat more frequently and like feel not like crap so that's always nice Um, but I think that just comes with like and now I'm eating a bit cleaner too. Okay. Excellent. Mm. Overall, it's working for you? Yeah. Yeah, hey, hey. yeah why not? Why not? <laughs> Ask me in a couple years. Uh, we'll see how it goes. Okay. <laughs> uh, let's, let's kind of pivot here and go towards kind of how we, we spent some of our time together. Mm-hmm. And working with the Pride was my first exposure, uh, truly, like, in, like, day in, day out, working with the female athlete. Mm-hmm. And so what I wanted to hear from you is when, from a player's perspective, right, what are things that rehab specialists or – performance pr- practitioners need to be mindful of when training the female athlete? Right. Um, mindful of? I don't think anything, really. I mean, <laughs> I don't know if this is going to sound bad, but like people, different people handle like their menstruation cycle like differently, maybe, um, but we also have like 
uh, like our daily trackers, like the Fit for 90s or whatever like that. Um, just making sure we're like honest, like with how we're feeling each day. So I think just that's helpful in knowing like, oh, like this player is like going through this time of the month. So they're going to be probably a little bit more fatigued or um, a little maybe grouchy. I don't know. Are you, do you, would you define yourself as grouchy? <laughs> no, I don't think so. But I think, um, and like I'm not like an expert on this either, but I think by eating cleaner and stuff, I think that really helps with my cycle. And like um, the, I don't know, the physical effects of it. Got it. So would you, would you be comfortable sharing what a cycle, how you feel, mm -hmm. being a professional athlete, and like how that might affect what say I would do with you? Mm -hmm. I think, um, wow, you're really g making me into a, a science person here. <laughs> <laughs> you're pretty knowledgeable, so I know you can handle um, it. I think more than anything, I know there's a fatigue element to it, but I think probably for a uh, mental side of it, like some people experience like pain and cramps more than others so like I think just being able to be mindful of that and not like no one's gonna I think use it as an excuse for things but kind of just like have that in the back of your mind when like maybe don't yell so much that's that's very fair <laughs> <laughs> that is very, it's like hey you're, you're kind of walk walk on eggshells here today <laughs> just just be mindful of what you're doing yeah. are there certain have you ever found yourself in a situation where right let me back up here. As a, as a male, as a male coach going into a female dominant weight room, mm -hmm. right? I think there's this question of, hey, like, is should I be changing my communication? Should I be changing the way I'm approaching the, the how I'm entering the room and interacting with the women versus how I might enter a mm -hmm. room and interacting with the men? What if, what advice would you have for someone that is in those spaces and trying to manage both groups? Um, I think. That's tough because I don't. I'm not sure what it's like outside of the the environment that I'm in. You know. Yeah. Um, but I think I've never experienced like um, anything crazy um, with strength coaches or even you. Like I think the communication that you've had is like been totally normal and spot on. And I think everyone knows that like, hey, we're like here to do a job and like get the best out of each other and. And I think that, you know, that communication and guidance reflects that. Yeah, I think ultimately you're all there to technically win a soccer game, mm -hmm. right? And everything leading up to that is for the benefit of everybody. Yeah. So I would imagine, like you said, the communication, as long as it's upfront mm -hmm. and genuine, it probably, probably suits best. Yeah. Wonderful. <laughs> uh, let's, let's pivot on another point here. One thing I want to been kind of, I've been not kind, I've been wanting to really chat to you about for a few years mm -hmm. now. All right, and let's let's kind of go big picture here. What I'm noticing more in in sport is women starting to elevate each other, mm -hmm. and they're really coming out sharing like 360 who they are, and like stories that come to mind are like Alex Morgan and Cindy LaRue coming out when they're pregnant, and mm -hmm. they're still returning to being a professional athlete. Yeah. Um, then Ro Robin Arzon from Peloton, you familiar with her? No. So one of the cycling instructors for Peloton, she was very public about her struggles with pregnancy. Mm -hmm. And then you yourself, you're how you endured breast cancer and came back to continue to be a professional athlete. So with all these women coming out and elevating each other and sharing their stories, especially in particular to you, mm -hmm. why was it important to do that? Um, I think just being in the spotlight, like I thought, you know, if I'm going through this, I would like to share in case it could, you know, affect one person, help anyone out there, um, saying like, hey, you're not alone, or like, I'm going through this too. And um, I think one thing that I've learned that like, no one is exempt or immune to anything, um, no matter how healthy you think you are or how fit you think you are, um, anything can happen at any time. And I think just being able to share that and uh, feel support and love and, and that was really awesome. And um, yeah, that was what, 2019. So here we are 2022 and um, yeah, still still playing soccer. 
<laughs> yes, I think the word that comes to mind is like just uh, like proud mm. because like you're sitting here in front of me and if I didn't know that story, I wouldn't know anything different from who you who you were years ago to who you are now. Like it, physically and personality wise, like I, you're still the same person to me. And I think that's just like a true testament to how you endured it and just how you embraced it, I think is what I'm hearing and feeling at the same time. Uh, you're gonna make me cry, Adam. <laughs> uh, for those that may be going through something similar, and it may not be breast cancer, but maybe mm-hmm. it is something else that really is challenging their identity or mm-hmm. challenging their life. Like what were some of the habits or daily reminders you had to kind of get, to kind of win the day and, and find your wins? I think just, I'd say two things. One, like knowing that I wasn't alone and knowing that, you know, whoever is going through something that you aren't alone. Um, there are people around you who support you and care for you and love for you and um, would do anything for you and will be there if you need a shoulder to lean on um, or help in any way. And I think the second thing was just like taking one day at a time, like doing the best I could in the moment and not really focusing on too much of the future um just doing everything that i could because right like when it happened i was like how can i get back on the field as soon as possible um didn't know like how or what that would look like but i decided that hey i was gonna use the day that i had to get me one step closer to getting back on the field it's a great mindset to take. Find it, taking it every day, one day at a time. Yeah. Where did you have struggles? Yeah, of course. I think I'm very much like I worry all the time, and I feel like <clears throat> I give myself anxiety because I'm like thinking so much ahead, and like, what about this? What if this? But I think I always have to remind myself to like come back down and like be present in it. Because if I'm not, I'm like just an anxious ball of like who knows what <laughs> an alter ego comes out yes i think that the, like I will, i'll speak for myself I, i'm the same way right like my mind can go wander mm-hmm. wander and wander and it's very hard to be present especially um i feel like with with social media like you're just constantly comparing yourself mm-hmm. and looking what other people are doing like you're supposed to be somewhere else but instead of being where you are like going like during that time period you're reminding yourself to be present yeah do you still struggle with trying to be present or is that like oh absolutely i'm like we're all human right yeah um but i think that's okay and um i just you know try to be kind to myself and when i see myself like shifting towards that like anxiety and like worrying too much like hey like i'm noticing this behavior like just reel it back in and like focus on what's in front of me do you have any like tools or tricks or habits that help you stay Um, stay grounded and present I try to meditate. Um, um, I really like walking and like getting out into nature and like being with my dog. I think cooking. um, I think, honestly, I think, and when I mean meditation, I don't always mean like just sitting in a room like quiet for like whatever with my eyes closed. I think what's great about that is like anything can be meditation. So like, I thought about this the other day when I was like cleaning my apartment, like, because I think a lot of people wouldn't think that could be meditation, right? It's like a chore or like a job, but like if you're in it, like that's all you're focused on, right? You're not worried about tomorrow. You're not worried about the next thing coming up. You're not worried about the next game. You're like in the present moment, focusing on what you're doing. And I think a lot of times I use those kind of activities as a form of meditation. That's one of the biggest lessons I had to teach myself is sitting sitting still mm-hmm. is something I struggle with. Yeah. If I'm not talking with someone, if mm-hmm. I'm not doing something. So the act of like a headspace or calm, like using one of those apps mm-hmm. to just sit, doesn't work for me. Yeah. But you said the best of going walking mm-hmm. or cleaning. I think cooking for me is meditation. Because mm-hmm. it's also it also taps into creativity as right. well, which is, it can be fun mm-hmm. at the same time. Yeah. Yeah, meditation, not my not my forte. <laughs> I'm just going to name it. My wife is like, yeah, you, you can't sit still too yeah. well. You know, I get it from my father. Yeah, it's it's hard. And I think a lot of people, like, they get upset with themselves because they, they, um, they're sitting there and, like, or laying there and, like, are thinking about other things. But I think that's, like, normal. And people don't really, like, mention that. Like, hey, like, you're going to have these other thoughts. Like, 
be mindful of it, acknowledge it, and then try and come back. Yeah. It's, it's not like do or die. <laughs> like, <laughs> There's just so much. You can right. think about other things. <laughs> <laughs> like put a pin in that one and come back to yeah, it later, right? Yeah. Like the pressure of having to be completely zen and mm-hmm. be in the space of nothing else matters is just challenging. It's yeah. hard for most people. Mm-hmm. If we bring it back here to some of the more topics that you and I are more familiar with mm-hmm. as far as soccer, training, rehab. Um, <clears throat> like in my field, we're often talking about what can we do to help you guys? Mm-hmm. But I think sometimes we miss listening or hearing or getting your take. So you've been in the league for how many years now? 10. 10 years. Mm-hmm. Let's, let's, let's talk about the, first off, like the start of your career in NWSL mm-hmm. and how NWSL and women's sports in general has evolved. Yeah. I think, pardon me, um, I think the investment has involved. I think facilities have, well, facilities comes with that. Um, the exposure, um, the level of professionalism, um, the level of support staff we have around us now, like all of that has improved and will continue to improve. And I think we can see like the results of that. Um, by, you know, just, we had our, our league final on primetime on CBS for like the first time ever. And like, we got amazing rating. And it's like, well, if you do that, like people will watch, people want to watch, um, but we have to get people in place who like want to invest and like believe in that. So I think that's where we are now. Of course, it could always be better, but I think from in that 10 years, like we have come such a long way. I remember there, my first year, like, some teams had to do their own like laundry for training kids and like the um, facilities were just like so terrible. Like some teams didn't even have a locker room. It's just like, we're like professional athletes. Like this is crazy. Like the college game is much better than this. Like we get whatever we want in college and like come here to be pro at the highest level. And it's just like, wasn't good enough. No, not even close. Yeah. What was, when I was, when we were together, I want to say like the minimum salary was somewhere around 30, 30,000. I think it was even lower than that. It must have been like 20s or lower. Right, like mid 20s. Yeah. So that was, and was it based on like, was it based on, because NWSL back then, Mm -hmm. I think this year, now it's a little bit longer season. It was what, what, six month season? Mm -hmm. And then so for the six month season, right, it's 20, let's call it 25,000 at that time. Was housing comp back then as well? Yes, so that includes your housing. So they take care of the housing. Like, and did it come with uh, meal expenses too, or is that um, part of your twenty five k? No, that was a part of your twenty five. So you, so there was for six months. You had your mm-hmm. housing taken care of, but all of the living expenses mm-hmm. you're y'all responsible for. Yes. Wow, that's that's yeah. tough. Mm-hmm. When during the season, like during those times, um, were you able to solely focus on? being a player or did you have to do other things to supplement your salary? I think thankfully I've always throughout my 10 years have only been um, fortunate enough to focus on the season at hand and not have to do um, anything for outside work. Um, I would like coach here and there and I still coach because like I really enjoy it so that's really cool but um, I think you know for the most part I was able to rely solely on on what I was making by the league. Did, were you aware of other women in the league that had to consider outside sources? Yeah, a lot of players and my teams, other teams um, had to get jobs or um, did coaching as well to make supplemental income. Um, yeah, it's tough out here. <laughs> yeah, it's, no, it's not. It's not as like, I think like, yeah, people hear, oh, you're a professional woman athlete, like you, life must be great, grand mm-hmm. and wonderful. But the reality is you've come with like, we've come a long way mm-hmm. from when you first started to where you are now. But one thing I remember too, that you were doing back uh, a few years ago was similar to how the WNBA players, they would go play overseas. Mm-hmm. Was that, that was a common practice when, when we were together, Yeah, correct? absolutely. And I think because like the off season then it was just too long like yeah. what are we going to do for 6 months without a salary or like even trying to stay fit for 6 months is like a really challenging task like to not get burnt out so a lot of, at the time the Australian league offset ours so we could go over start with that league and then have a little bit of a break come back to the NWSL to play um I did that one time, um, I really enjoyed it. I think it was a great experience and like way to see the world and meet new people and um, not just have to run by myself for six months. So that was nice. 
that's when there's no one there it's tough you're right like it's tough for six months of not having a competition mm -hmm. not being able aside from testing right yeah. like you can you can test you can improve your six minute improve your your mile mm -hmm. try and get it five six minutes whatever it may be but nothing is yeah. as rewarding as a game and seeing mm -hmm. the fruits of your labor manifest there yeah and i think too we've always i always forget this sometimes that like soccer fitness is just so different from regular fitness oh that's okay let's talk, let's dive in on this topic <laughs> oh and this, and this is great it's a great segue it's, it's awesome because because you're right like there's people that right there's people in my industry mm -hmm. that on the outside looking in right you only know what you know mm -hmm. and we we put out these conditioning programs put out these conditioning programs and i'm gonna i'm gonna measure your heart rate i'm gonna do hrv mm -hmm. we're gonna measure output and all of these things but ultimately hearing from an athlete right now just said hey the one thing that gets me fit is playing my sport playing your sport and i think that's where we're starting to get there we're starting to get mm -hmm. there as an industry and integrate and incorporate something like europeans do it really well like the european soccer culture does it really well i think mls does it really well mm -hmm. i think other sports are catching up okay. as far as dosing in like hey how do we use the sport itself mm -hmm. and not think in isolation that oh strength and conditioning you guys operate in the weight room mm -hmm. conditioning you guys operate on the treadmill on the bike right like oh like our team is fit yeah, yeah coach the team might be unfit they mm -hmm. also much might be tired but there's things that we can do in practice like hey let's let's open the field up a little bit mm -hmm. right let's let's play in shorter spaces let's play in bigger spaces All right so i think it's just a great point to hear a player say yeah. listen I'll run for you and yes. I'll do my temple runs and I'll do my sprints, but mm -hmm. ultimately I need to play the game to be fit. Mm -hmm. Did you ever feel like there was an off season where you lost the ability to play and going into preseason was a struggle? Yeah, I think, I think just right like our off seasons are typically a bit longer. We're now in a period where like they're only, I think four months or so, but I think we don't want to lose the fitness, right? And we are so isolated. We're not, we don't all have the luxury of just being here together because we only have our housing for the duration of the season. So people go back home with their parents, they go back with their partners or whatever. So we don't always have the ability to stay together and play. So we are so reliant on our individual capabilities with what we have, whether that's in the gym or running, right? And you can get as fit as you want and like get those times to what they need to be and pass the fitness test. But as soon as you like get into like playing like small sided or 11 aside, it just doesn't translate all the time. Um, I think now we're getting to a point where we have our housing year long which is great. So even when we're not in season, we still have it for the whole year. So people are able to stay. And so we're able to keep training together. And I think that's very, very beneficial. Um, and I think, you know, here in Orlando, I'm lucky enough to be surrounded by a lot of ex players who, you know, we play pickup like all the time, like after work or mm -hmm. after like we're coaching sessions and stuff. So that's really awesome. Yeah, that's it's it's nice to hear that like the investment is there because ultimately it the, if the investment goes in and we're talking more like the business and financial mm -hmm. components of the league because there's so much more to sport than just the sport that mm -hmm. affects you right the right. business the marketing the media that all plays a role i think it's fantastic that they had the nwsl final on what, primetime national mm -hmm. tv which was just this you said this was the first year they did that yeah so it, it's bringing awareness and it's helping all of you ultimately do what you do well because mm -hmm. you don't have to worry about oh man like where am i going to train this off season where right. am i going to live it's taking that stress off you which i think is fantastic for you. i'm so happy mm -hmm. that they're finally getting there <laughs> we're getting there because <laughs> the w the w sharing the same sentiment there because that's for the longest time the the what female basketball players have had mm -hmm. to do the same thing um had to had to go overseas and they actually make more money over there than they do here. Right. Um, so a lot of them will miss some of the preseasons because, mm -hmm. well, they're paying me X yeah. and y'all are paying me Y. Like, um, mm -hmm. I'm going to stay here. Right. So I, <clears throat> it's nice to see everybody starting to take mm -hmm. care and elevate the women in sport. Yeah. So on that note, how, um, how do you feel like we can continue to elevate the women in sport? I think just keep investing in women's sports. Um, 
and wanting to and realizing the value in it. I think what you put in is what you get out. And I think we're starting to see that. Um, if you give us the resources, then like you said, we're able to just focus on solely our job, get better at our job. Um, if you put us on prime time, fans are going to watch. You're going to be like, oh, wow, like there's a market for this. People want to see, like we can make money, like all of these things. People get excited about it. Maybe they start coming to games. Um, so I think as long as the investment's there, like will keep growing. Absolutely. And with some of the coaching that you're doing, are you seeing an effect on the youth that, like, there's the, their games are on TV now, mm -hmm. and some of the youth players can actually watch a women's soccer game? Because I think, I would imagine, I don't think, I would imagine if I'm a, if I'm a young girl, mm -hmm. and I want to be I want to be Tony Presley, and I can't watch you unless I physically go to the game. Yeah. It must kind of be like this disconnect of, well, is it really possible mm -hmm. to get there? Like, right. Are you seeing that in some of the kids you're coaching? Yeah, I think just being able to have our games on TV or streaming services, it's such a big step um, in getting that visibility and getting young girls invested and involved and, you know, seeing players that look like them and visibility and like, oh, like, hey, this girl's doing it. I can do it too. And, um, you know, as the league grows, you know, hopefully we'll just keep continuing to get more teams and more teams into different markets and that'll encourage, you know, teams and and or sorry players and young girls in those markets to go to games and get involved with you know the community and um, I think that will just help grow the women's game at a youth level as Got well it. and the uh, the women have the uh, on, the, on the men's side right mm -hmm. in MLS they have the academy system mm -hmm. is the NWSL adopting an academy system as well we do not have an academy system um, I don't know if that will at least I don't think we do I should probably know this. I'm pretty sure we don't. I feel like okay. I would know. So what's the what's the <laughs> so is the current? <laughs> it's okay. You don't, can't know everything. What's the current path? Yeah. If, right. So is it still a college system? We have like ODPs and um, the the girls academy league, the GA, um, and then like ECNL okay. to get like exposure to like nas youth national teams into colleges and things okay. like that. Um, but I think even that's difficult because. It, there's just so many youth leagues, right? And there's just so many girls playing soccer. It's like, it, it, that's a whole different topic, but like there's a lot of girls who like slip through the cracks because, you know, youth soccer is like, you gotta have money to play. Okay, where are your thoughts on this? Let's go there. No, let's go there. Because um, pay, pay to play is, is, a, is a topic of contention yeah. within youth sports everywhere. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I like, I'll share stories uh, on the basketball side that I hear. I mean. And, there, luckily, there's a lot of NBA players that are sponsoring AAU teams and AAU mm -hmm. leagues because of the resources they have, right. and it's elevating the youth basketball system. I imagine those resources may not be the same on the soccer side, given the compensation that happens at the highest level. Yeah. So let's talk pay to play. Where does Tony Presley take yeah. this? I think it's just, I mean, it's, it's like when I was growing up, it was, I think, just not as crazy as it is now. Like you want to play soccer, you just go play soccer. I don't know. Um, I think now it's become such, you know, with the amount like youth coach soccer, like, sorry, I'm, my words, the amount of money now that youth coaches are making and the fees that they're charging these kids and these families to play in like these like suburban areas, like we're missing out on so much talent in like the inner cities or um, I think, it kind of, I don't know, it just, we got to find a way to get everyone involved in sport and feel like they can be a part of it and not miss out because they can't afford to play a game. Like, it's a game. <laughs> yeah, it's so true. And I know for me and my brothers, like, we were very fortunate um, able to play a lot of sports growing up. Um, it served us well in so many ways. Like the analogy, like I think sport is an analogy for a lot of things. Mm -hmm. Like what comes to mind as an analogy for sport? I think just communication and the, the teamwork that you learn and being able to be coachable. And I think it teaches so many life lessons um, about being a member of society and a member of a community and um, your individual self, um, confidence and like worth e work ethic. Um, yeah, like sport teaches so much. And if we can get so many more kids exposed to ha so many different sports, like think of like the values and things that we're gonna be able to teach like 
the masses, you know? 100%. Was there a, like, do you have a memory or a moment where you really found that if I, if I didn't play sports, I would struggle here? Um, I don't think that ever really came to mind. Um, right. Cause as your kid, you're, I think you're just not thinking about that stuff. Yeah. Um, but I'm sure like when I become a parent, I might start thinking about that. Like, wow, like if my kid's not like active in some way, who knows what they're going to be doing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it would have gotten into trouble if I didn't play sports. Yeah. I don't know. I think that's a fair thing. I think if you're on a team. At least you have accountability amongst yourselves yeah. and you, you are staying out of trouble. Yeah. I certainly would imagine that's why. I played sports, definitely still <laughs> cause trouble. I still <laughs> managed to find a way to cause trouble. Uh, my mother will attest to that for mm. sure. <laughs> uh, so there's like, there's a lot of, there's a lot to like what you've done in life from enduring breast cancer. By the way, this is a curiosity. What is the proper language around someone that goes through breast cancer? Is it enduring? Is it surviving? Because I've heard other different mixed messages on that. Yeah, I think um, once all of the like cancer is removed um, and like a certain period of time has passed and you become like a survivor. Um, I could be wrong. I don't know all the answers. What does it mean to you? Like what would you, what would you um, say? I would consider myself a survivor of breast cancer. Um, yeah, it's been some time and um, I haven't had any complications thus far. Um, yeah. That's a yeah. that's a blessing, and it's it is very, a blessing. Very fortunate for you, and at the same time, I'm so proud that you are still playing at a highest level as well. Thanks, Adam. Of course. <laughs> so within all of this of surviving breast cancer, being a professional athlete, both your FSU, mm -hmm. were you drafted by Orlando? No, I was. Um, God, so when I I got drafted by, I think it was the Philadelphia Independence. But then the league folded okay. when I got drafted. Got it. So then I went overseas to Russia to play. Okay. And um, when I was there, the league were now um, okay. emerged. So then, so you went from so let's talking about playing college, mm -hmm. okay, playing playing in Russia, mm -hmm. coming back to the states, playing, yep. surviving breast cancer, playing in Australia, mm -hmm. a lot of different environments that you were in, mm -hmm. right? I would imagine to keep yourself going, right? There's a lot of wins you had to find. How would you define a small win? I could be as simple as just waking up every day and like just choosing to be like my best self, to be honest. Um, it's what I've been in this league for 10 years and I've been playing for 11 years. It's not always easy. I'm, as you know, like there are days I wake up and I'm like, oh, I really don't want to do this. There are days I wake up and I'm like, yes, I'm so excited to do this. But I think just waking up and like being able to give the best version of myself that I have or like the a hundred percent of whatever percent that I have that day and committing to that hundred percent a hundred percent a hundred percent I love it one thing um, I always see players struggle with is in the rehab setting mm. right because in rehab when you have a long-term injury when it's short term you can kind of see the, the light at the end of the tunnel but when it's a long rehab case mm -hmm. you, know, it's, you have part of your identity removed have you ever experienced where you've had a long-term rehab um, Were you out for a significant amount of time? I think the most I've ever been out was like three or four months. Okay. So Thankfully. I would, yeah. Is that a long time to I you? would consider, yeah. I think anything beyond four weeks is. Oh, okay, great. I think anything beyond four weeks is a longer time. <laughs> um, yeah, I think it's always the, it's hard, right? Because a lot of times you're doing a lot more work than the people who are healthy and in training are doing right you have to be there for all of the things that the healthy people are there for but then you have to go off and do your action items as well um and kind of like feeling like you're not a part of the team chemistry anymore because you're like so far removed like doing your own thing you don't get to go outside with them and like joke around but like you have to stay inside it's just like i think sometimes that can be kind of hard like that disconnect yeah. Um, I don't know. How well, do you, I mean, no, I, I, you, you're hitting things that I see. Okay. Like you're hitting things that I see. And I think it's important to hear it from someone that goes through it because we want to like people in my, my space, mm -hmm. my, my seat want to help as best we can. Right. But we can't always feel what you feel. Yeah. We can't always experience. And I've never played professional soccer. So I don't know what it's like to know that, Hey, like this injury 
hopefully I'm hoping I can get through it, mm -hmm. but it could be my livelihood. It could yeah. be my paycheck. Mm -hmm. So for those that in my space, uh, working on the performance of rehab side, how can we better serve you in those moments? I don't know. That's a tough one because obviously you're there like doing your job and being professional and giving uh, your players like the best care that you could be giving them. But I think maybe just, and I'm sure you're always very kind, Adam, but I think just not forgetting to um, incorporate that like human element as well. Sorry, my watch is just going off. Um, but yeah, just like always kind of bringing that human element to things and like um, keep things light when you can make things light or um, I don't know. Does that make sense? Yeah. It okay. Makes sense. Like what, what I'm hearing you say is don't forget about the human behind the player. Yeah. Right. I think like one expression that comes to mind for me is treat the person, not the diagnosis. Because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, most of us in this space can get the job done when it comes to the rehab, comes mm -hmm. to the training. But I think what makes and I'd love to get your take on this. I think what makes coaches great, practitioners great, is when they do respect and acknowledge that human element because mm -hmm. ultimately that's what's going to lead to motivation. That's what's going to lead to more effort on your end. Mm -hmm. I think having you know this expression of we're in this together and I see you and I hear you, yeah. like I recognize that. Yeah, and just realizing like not everyone's going to have a great day every day and just kind of being able to take that into consideration um, and like, I don't know, just give us a little push just give a you a little mental nugget. push or a little extra a little extra hugging or something i don't know are there things that have that, that help you out in those moments um i think it could just be as simple as like asking people hey how are you i think we we forget about that sometimes um like hey like how are you doing today like how are you really doing like i'm not just asking this just because it's you know cordial or just you know like a high but like I don't know. I think if we, but I think that comes with like a level of trust too, right? Like you build this level of trust with your athletes and like they'll feel comfortable and like expressing those things to you hopefully. And we talk now, I think so much in this day and age of like mental health and how that can really affect performance. And if your, your mental health is like off, you're not, I don't think you're going to perform well. So we, it's, it's just a whole holistic thing. It's a big thing. It's a very, it's a, <laughs> <laughs> it's a very big thing. Uh, like the, like you alluded to the, the mental side of things and, and the mental health side, mental health, mental mm -hmm. m uh, mindset, wellness. Like there's a lot of things that we're bringing to awareness. I think it's been fantastic. And I see that being kind of the friction point for athletes when they're going through either a down point, like mm -hmm. in the season, right? They're, they're not playing well or they're having a difficult time overcoming a rehab. Like I think of guys that guys and guys and gals, men and women mm -hmm. that have to go through, let's say like an ACL. Yeah. Like we know that's a 12 to 14 month process. That's a long time to be removed mm -hmm. from sport. And if it's not for optimism and the people around you bringing you up and mm -hmm. your teammates, but also the people working with you, it makes that process very uh, challenging. Mm -hmm. And I think it does ultimately lead to a different outcome in the end. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's a challenge to find that space yeah. and, f and help you guys get through that. I know it is. And I think one thing that could help it, there's gotta be a way like we can make things fun every now and then. Like it doesn't have to be this like mundane process and like grueling process of I'm here, I'm rehabbing. It's the same thing over and over again. There's like no human element to it. Like there's gotta be a time where, you know, an easier day, like, Hey, we're going to do this today. We're going to switch it up. We're going to have some fun, like, you know, that's a great break it up. It's a great point because in, in sports, we see each other every day, almost mm -hmm. every day. Mm -hmm. And if you have to do the same thing over and over, mm -hmm. it gets mundane and boring. Yeah. So to bring other things that you've done, like in those moments that are fun, like any ideas that come to mind? Mm, I think it just as simple as like, Hey, we're going to play a game today. Like this is an easy recovery day for you. Like, you've earned it, like we're gonna play a fun game. I don't know what that's gonna be, but like, instead of like just me being on the bike by myself for however many minutes, like we're gonna do this instead. I got it. Like we talking board game, card game? Uh, it could be a physical game, okay. you know? And you went to spike ball? Oh, I'm so bad at it. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I hit the, uh, 
um, the little metal part around it yeah. so many times. But that's good though, right? Because then the other team can't get it. Well, they can't get it, but they I also depending what depending on the house rules, someone may say like that's a fault in. Mm, right? Yeah. So no, I'm not gonna. Not not no, gonna. Okay. Not for me. All right, let's wrap things up here okay. and let's go through some quick hitters. We're okay. gonna go first word that comes to mind. Are you oh, ready? Oh dear. Uh huh. All right. Uh, one thing women can do better than men. Multitask. It is you that is crazy because I the <laughs> last guest that came on the episode, shout out to Stacy. Last guest that came on said the exact same really? thing. Yeah, yes. That is amazing. All right. One word. Ready? Mm-hmm. Women are. Awesome. I love that. A vegan lifestyle is fulfilling. Hmm. Soccer is. Football is life. <laughs> Great show, by the it's way. An amazing show. I am like so excited for that. Was it third season of yes. Tabasso? Mm-hmm. Oh, that is the best. Okay, side note. The best okay. part, what they got right about that show so well are all the nuances and like language mm-hmm. in soccer and having an American trying to understand that and the character of Ted mm-hmm. Lasso was phenomenal. So good. Like his initial press conference of win, you know, win or loss, where we're gonna go. And I think mm-hmm. it's like, or tie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or tie. Or tie. <laughs> Uh, great show. Oh, mm-hmm. Is it one of your favorite shows, by the way? It is. It's, oh. it's like, it's so well done. It's like, it's it's so light, but like, I don't know. It's so engaging. Like, uh, it's got all the things. They string so many chords in that. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really good show. All right. And during breast cancer, all comes down to? Mm, community. Mm. Who is your community? My friends, my family, my teammates. The city of Orlando. Yeah, they, they got behind you big time. Mm-hmm. That was awesome. Last one. The vibe of a woman's locker room after a win. Dope. <laughs> dope. It's I was a dope hoping for vibe. like I was hoping for like, yo, it's a dance party up in here. <laughs> like we're all, you know, doing our thing. Oh, dope. It is a okay. dope vibe. A dope vibe. Well, Tony, thanks for for swinging by. I know we talked about your book. Uh, coming out again. When is that coming out? Um, it should be released hopefully November 2023. Girls Gone Veg. Girls Gone Veg. And cookbook? Cookbook. Available where? I think anywhere. Amazon, hopefully some stores. I don't know. We'll uh, it would be nice. Got a nice hard copy? Yeah. Hard and then copy. Girls Gone Veg, you'll have a YouTube channel coming out? Um, so we have some YouTube shows um, on the I Am Athlete platform. Okay. Um, yeah, I think like eight or so episodes on there. Okay. Check them out. All right. Girls Gone Veg, book, mm-hmm. I Am Athlete. Check it out. And mm-hmm. social media. You there? Yep. So Instagram is Tony Dion, T O N I D E I O N. Um, I have Twitter, but I don't remember what that is. So, oh well. We'll put everything in the show <laughs> notes so everyone can keep track. Well, thanks for swinging by and just great to catch up with you today. Oh, always.